Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jesse Silsky, Communications Director for the Global Center for Food Systems Innovation at Michigan State University. In a few minutes, you'll be hearing from Eric Crawford and Stephanie White, who will be discussing the findings of our most recent center-led research projects in Malawi, Africa. These integrated projects were designed to examine what types of investments would be needed to support the scaling up of multi-purpose legume maize systems in the region, and what the medium-term impacts might be across the food system in Malawi. Joining MSU's faculty in 1979, Eric Crawford has an extensive and multifaceted background in international agricultural development. He has been a core faculty member of USAID-funded rural development and food security projects in Africa since 1980. He has worked in Senegal in farming systems research and food security policy, and his research and outreach has included the modeling of climate change impacts on household food security in Africa, the applications of budgeting and investment analysis techniques in developing countries, cost-benefit analysis of agricultural import input support systems, and the evaluation of agricultural research impacts in Africa. Stephanie White recently completed her PhD in the Department of Community Sustainability at MSU and presently holds a dual appointment with GCFSI and the Center for Regional Food Systems. Her current research focuses on urban food systems in the Global South, primarily in relation to small-scale food-based livelihoods, which includes urban agriculture, small-scale trade, and urban livestock production. In addition, she is interested in better understanding how social and spatial aspects, aspects of urban food systems, I'm sorry, urban food environments can foster or inhibit urban food security. Prior to arriving at MSU, Stephanie worked in Washington, D.C. for a number of development organizations, including Encompass and the Peace Corps. Eric and Stephanie's presentation will last about 40 minutes, which should leave us about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Please feel free to post them during the presentation using the Q&A tab on your webinar window. If Eric and Stephanie can't answer all the questions before we run out of time, they'll do their best to follow up afterward. Uh, with that, I'll give Stephanie a, a couple minutes to set up and we'll be right with you shortly. Greetings, good morning. Thank you for joining us today as we report out on the research um, that GCFSI conducted during the summer of 2014. My name is Stephanie White, and I'm a researcher with GCFSI and took the initial lead on organizing and drafting the synthesis document. I'm joined by Eric Crawford, as, as already mentioned, um, who is GCFSI's director and synthesis co-author. So today we'll be briefing you on the analysis and findings of the GCFSI research conducted in collaboration with uh, the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources during the summer of 2014. The presentation will proceed like this. First, we'll give you some background on GCFSI. Uh, then we will give you some background on the Malawi Research Project. We will talk about the various research proje projects that were implemented. Um, and then we will go over some of the keystone or critical issues raised by the research results. We will then um, speak to recommendations for scaling up the multipurpose legume maize systems. We will talk about the estimated medium-term impacts and then the relevance of findings for scaling of other crop value chains and then um, end with next steps. So first, background on GCFSI. GCFSI is one of eight university innovation centers funded by USAID under the HESEN or Higher Education Solutions Network. The goal of GCFSI is to create, test, and enable the scaling of innovations in the food system using an approach that is multidisciplinary, focused on the entire food system, forward-looking and considers major trends that will impact the future of food system performance, and those trends include population growth, climate change, and pressure on land, rapid urbanization and income growth, and workforce development. So GCFSI carries out its mandate in a number of ways, including through grants to people doing innovative work in food systems, including students, and through center-led projects. The research in Malawi was an example of a center-led project and embodied these characteristics that I've just gone over, um, of being multidisciplinary, focused on the entire food system, and forward-looking. So with an understanding of what GCFSI does, uh, and what its approach is, let's dive into the synthesis report. 
Early in 2014, as the GCFSI team was working to put its goals into practice, the decision was made to implement a multi-team research project in which all teams would work to answer this question here. Where and how can multi-purpose legumes be scaled for sustainable intensification of maize systems and what would the potential impacts be in the medium term across the food system in Malawi? So as you can see, the focus here is on scaling the already identified innovative technology, which is sustainable intensification using multipurpose legumes in maize-based systems. That multiple teams were charged with answering this question, bringing to bear their own expertise, recognizes that scaling is a complex endeavor and really relies on understanding what's going on with multipurpose legume maze systems from multiple perspectives and multiple entry points. So in the next several slides, I'll get to how we disaggregated the scaling question so that we could get a handle on it and look at it from multiple angles in a way that got at the different aspects of those multipurpose legume maze systems. And for those not familiar, familiar multipurpose legumes are those legumes that have multiple ro roles in the agri-food cropping system. For example, they may pro provide for soil fertility, they may provide a source of nutrition or income, um, they may provide for firewood or fodder for livestock. And in this case, medium term refers to about a five to 10 year period. So it was the task of each team to bring their expertise to bear on answering this question. But at the same time, it was important for us to have a sort of guiding framework for understanding how the research fit fit together. In conceptualizing this, we took a view of food systems that considers not only the activities associated with food production and exchange, which is typically how food systems are conceived, but we also wanted to, um, to, to work with the context that would shape how food systems are carried out. So yes, the technology we're concerned about happens in the farmer's fields, but the dynamics that influence whether or not a farmer will choose to practice this technology go well beyond the farm gate and are influenced by wider social and economic dynamics. Our organizing approach is illustrated by this graphic. Research that was done tended to favor one of these thematic areas, though there was overlap. Um, so agroecology and climate, markets, policies, and institutions, skills and education, and gender and social factors. So essentially, these, what these thematic areas do is describe the particular angle or entry point into the research that the research teams focused on in exploring the, quest, the main research question. So now I'll just go through each thematic area and tell you how each team approached the question. Essentially, these next things that we're going through are just descriptions of the, what the various um, research is, and then I'll show you a, um, a couple of slides that have the actual title of the report and the research teams associated. Um, okay, so for agroecology and climate, what the teams looked at were, um, first of all, on-farm experimentation with farmer groups to identify ways that legumes can support sustainable intensification of maize. Um, and that, so that was mainly focused on farmers and their decision making. Uh, the two and three are more of a um, overview, more of sort of a, a, a landscape-wide look at what's going on with the environmental aspects. Um, so two is climate, climate land use and watershed modeling to evaluate the potential for scaling improved legume maize production systems. And number three is modeling climate change impacts on maize and irrigated rice production systems. Um, for markets, policies, and institutions, one team mapped the current legume marketing system and assessed future growth in demand. Another team, which is my actual team, um, mapped the informal legume markets in the long ways and identified op opportunities and constraints for expansion of pigeon pea marketing. Another team identified policy and institutional constraints at a larger sort of Malawi-wide scale that affected the performance of legume value chains. For looking at skills and education that would be associated with scaling, um, one team developed and assessed the value of participatory video methods to enhance knowledge, and another team uh, mapped the stakeholders relevant to workforce development in the legume value chain and assessed the needs within Luanar uh, for stronger capacity to support workforce development. 
And then um, gender analysis uh, was performed on the pigeon P value chain and, uh, and identified gender and broader social constraints to improve legume uh, maize production and marketing. So what I want to do now is just give you a, a look at um, the different – these are the, the, the different um, research projects and the researchers associated with that. And I won't go through, but I do want you to know that this is here. Uh, you can go back to look at these um, – the teams of research available with – or that were involved with each of the research projects. Okay, so, um, so what we ended up focusing mostly on pigeon pea. Um, several teams did remain agnostic in terms of the legume they focused on, but several others fo strongly focused favored pigeon pea. And while soybeans and groundnuts are a, a feed the future program priority in Malawi. Pigeon pea was the multi-purpose legume that received the most attention, and that is because it, it provides a full range of multi-purpose benefits, some of those that I had gone over before. It's fodder, it's uh, nutrition, it's income, um, and it's nitrogen fixing, so soil improvement. It's a, it's a long growing cycle, allows it to fix more nitrogen and add more organic matter to the soil um, than many other legumes and it improves the level and stability of intercrop maize yields. It also faces a strong export market. At least 25% of Malawi's production is processed and exported, and it provides income earning opportunities for women. Uh, women are particularly knowledgeable about the cultivation of this crop. Um, Okay, so not only does taking a system perspective to scaling a technology mean understanding things through multiple frames of reference or disciplines that I had, as I already spoke to, but it also means understanding what goes on beyond the farm gate. It means understanding how the commodity is important to people in both rural and urban areas. It means understanding how it is important to both formal and informal exchange relationships so that opportunities for supporting or improving the various aspects of the system can be identified. And it means looking at the relationships that comprise the system, meaning we looked at how various institutions were shaping legume trade and adoption, how policies could influence adoption, where it made sense to grow in relation to biophysical and environmental factors and how various social factors, especially gender, shaped who grew it. So a little bit more on the social dimensions. Um, I, I just want to point out that the emphasis, there were several researchers that placed an emphasis on capturing and considering social dynamics and relationships in relation to scaling sustainable intensification. So in addition to characterizing maize legume systems at the 40,000 foot level, which means understanding how institutions, um, broad environmental and landscape factors, policies, how all those things are implicated in scaling, several research projects also paid particular attention to the social relationships that comprise the system and to particular social positionings within the system. So what this means for the output of the research is that there has been a strong effort to consider scaling as a social process and not just a techno, techno, technical or technological one. So for example, um, Dr. Natalie Mainsope's analysis looked at gender roles and relationships along the value chain, which very much affect who does what, what opportunities exist for whom, and what sorts of constraints would need to be considered in interventions. There are some videos that GCFSI produced from this research that go more deeply into the social dimensions, and those uh, URLs are here on the slide. Um, Ruth, which, who is the woman who's in the top picture there, um, we followed her to understand what she goes through in terms of her daily life and buying and selling legumes, um, while another video, um, performed by Chip Steinfeld's team, provides an example of a participatory video that models socially and culturally informed nutrition messages. Okay, so on to the keystone issues that are raised by the research. Um, now these are issues that are of critical importance to scaling the multipurpose legume technology. Um, and how we've broadly organized is into four different categories. Those are networking capacity, 
post-harvest infrastructure, seed systems, and access to information, services, and capital. Networking capacity refers to the limited access that each actor in the system has to other actors in the system. This means that many players along the value chain have a limited number of options in terms of where they can do business. It also means that many people are limited in their mobility for a number of reasons, both social and sort of broad um, infrastructural reasons. And so they have little access to each other in a very physical sense. Um, Post-harvest infrastructure means that transportation, storage, and process processing options are limited and or very costly. Transportation, for example, is a major expense for urban legume retailers and severely limits their ability to grow their businesses. Both on and off farm storage in both urban and rural areas is problematic and has implications for storing legumes for a long period of time. And of course, damaged legumes fetch a lower price, so this obviously has implications for income as well. Processing options were particularly limited for pigeon pea. In general, only the large-scale processors had the means to dehull and split pigeon pea, um, which is important in terms of being able to cook it more quickly. May and Sope found that this increased. Okay, so not only were there problems um, with that in terms of being able to buy it because you need a, a short cooking time, but it's also main so uh, Natalie, Dr. Main Sope found that this is it increased the price. Um, from farm to urban market by three times. Um, so for seed systems, uh, that was in, this is another uh, keystone issue that needs to be addressed. Farmers have diverse needs and preferences that the formal seed sector has not been able to respond to well. Uh, there is widespread recognition that a more vibrant seed sector needs to be developed that actually encourages innovation, the ability to innovate, and the um, the impetus to innovate among local seed producers. And then lastly, small scale actors along the value chain have very limited access to information services and capital. And without this basic requirement, actors have very little ability to make improvements or to experiment with new ideas. Okay, and so now I'll turn it over to Eric. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, the next set of slides addresses the part of the overall research question that asks about how to scale up the improved legume maize technology. And we're going to look at four issues listed here on this slide. What target groups and target zones would we uh, tackle? What specific areas are most suitable for maize, uh, multipurpose legume and maize technology? What investments are needed to enable the scale up of this technology? And what impacts would result? While soybean, groundnut, and common or climbing beans can be incorporated into an MLM system, we're focusing on pigeon pea and the pigeon pea value chain for the reasons that Stephanie uh, alluded to earlier, including its importance as a women's crop. In choosing target groups and target zones, uh, we want to take into account biophysical conditions, location of markets, and other socioeconomic factors. Uh, the research that was carried out suggested two target groups, which are shown here in the second and third columns of the table. Uh, each group would require a different approach to multipurpose legume and maize scaling. Group one consists of uh, farmers who have good access to land and capital resources. And for them, the strategy would focus on developing access to commercial or export markets. This group we estimate to be relatively small, less than 10% of the overall number of farmers. Group two would be farmers with minimal access to uh, land, labor, and capital resources. And for them, the strategy would focus on improving soil fertility through the addition of legumes and then uh, developing nutrition and livelihood security through that system. This group of farmers is numerically much larger, probably about 70% of the total number of farmers. Each of these two groups uh, should be divided into two further groups uh, based on geographical location and what that implies for biophysical growing conditions and market access. So if we look at the second and third rows of the table, uh, in North and Central Malawi, population density is lower um, and if that means more land available per household, growing conditions are better. And so for group one, the strategy here could focus on soybeans and pigeon pea as cash crops oriented to the domestic livestock feed and export markets respectively. For group two, the focus could be on 
pigeon pea in rotation with maize, although there's some potential for climbing bean in northern region. In the south, population density is higher, households have less land per household, and production conditions are more variable. Here, for group one, the focus would be on pigeon pea production for the Blantyre export market, and for group two, intercropping pigeon pea with maize in order to improve soil fertility and strengthen the resilience of the farming system in response to increasingly uncertain climate conditions. This next figure gives another perspective on the pathways that each group might follow to achieve sustainable in intensification. The diagram shows time on the horizontal axis and the degree of sustainable intensification on the vertical axis. Households in group one with suitable support, including improved input and output markets, face a relatively straightforward pathway to adoption of improved varieties of soybean and pigeon pea, combined with appropriate fertilizer application and use of drought tolerant maize varieties. The pathway for group two, however, must begin with rehabilitation of soils, partly through introduction of legumes, followed by farmer education regarding the purpose behind integrated MLM production systems and how best to implement it. Of course, these two target groups and the pathways represent very broad categories which would need to be defined more precisely. For example, since pigeon pea is a crop that's managed primarily by women, special care would need to be taken to ensure that women benefit from any plan to scale up MLM technology. Target zones would also need to be identified more specifically. As, as shown in this slide and the next two slides, research by the GCFSI team would allow us to do this based on geographical and market factors. This particular slide combines information on temperature and rainfall with information on the growing conditions needed by pigeon pea in order to identify at a high degree of spatial resolution the areas in Malawi that are optimal for pigeon pea. The map shows this for each extension programming area or EPA shaded to indicate the percentage of each EPA that is optimal for pigeon pea. Darker shading indicates a higher percent of area optimal for pigeon pea. The results indicate that EPAs with a high percent of land optimal for pigeon pea are clustered in central Malawi and north and east of Blantyre in the south. And these EPAs are also closer to the major markets of Blantyre and the long way. This map uses detailed land use and climate data for the period 2000 to 2014 to examine two dimensions of agricultural productivity level of productivity, ranging from low to average to high, and variability of productivity, where we use the term sensitive to mean high variability from year to year, and resilient, meaning low variability from year to year. The purpose of this map is to provide information relevant to decisions about targeting of MLM technology, depending on whether you want to boost production or exports or improve incomes and food security for relatively poor farmers. The six boxes at the top right of the figure show the percentage of Malawi's total area that falls into each of the six categories, defined by level of productivity and variability of productivity. Nearly 75% of the land area falls into the average productivity category, dark and light blue, of which two-thirds is sensitive. Average productivity areas are concentrated in the south and center and high productivity in the north. One conclusion from this map is that the South has a high proportion of areas with below average yields, dark orange, and sensitivity to climate shocks, dark blue. Given its small farm sizes, the South is likely to be where many members of target group A are found and where expansion of the MLM technology would improve, improve the level and the resilience or stability of yields. Also, Blantyre in the south is the location of the large-scale pigeon pea processing and export infrastructure, which is relevant to group one. However, expansion of MLM in some parts of the south may be limited by biophysical factors. It has a substantial area of low and variable productivity, shown in the dark orange here, caused by sandy soils and a high water table where heavy rain can create water logging and kill maize roots. In northern Malawi, soil fertility is a less pressing issue and farmers already have generally good legume maize productivity 
and a profitable cash crop in tobacco. So for them, the impetus currently for adoption of MLM technology may be low, although Pigeon Pea has been introduced there with some success. This map plots locations that are optimal for Pigeon Pea and also marginal for maize for the seven reasons that are shown in the legend, which have to do with soil, rainfall, and temperature factors. If the idea is to add pigeon pea to the maize production system in order to improve the level and resilience of maize productivity, the map can help answer the question of where best to target the addition of pigeon pea. The answers which are listed on the slide are, yes, this makes sense in areas where pigeon pea addresses soil fertility constraints on, may, on maize, but no, not in areas where high or low temperature is the constraint since pigeon pea obviously can't do anything about temperature. Now let's look at the types of investments that would be needed to support scale up of MLM technology focusing on central Malawi for purposes of illustration. As a general point, investments should be targeted all along the pigeon pea value chain and should take account of the fact that pigeon pea is produced by women although they lack the means or infrastructure with which to process it and are often constrained by social roles for marketing or transporting it. Realizing the benefits of MLM technology will therefore require interventions that are specifically designed to meet the needs of women and then account for their social positions within society and the constraints and opportunities that they face. So the first area of investment here is to build farmer knowledge and capacity regarding use of appropriate agronomic practices for MLM production. Adoption of pigeon pea must be supported by extension that explores and teaches appropriate agronomic management practices. Farmer field schools, which have been used by our team in Malawi, have been shown to be an effective extension approach because it supports action learning and teaches science-based principles as well as good farm management practices. One issue that the team discovered there was the importance of livestock management uh, in, in introducing legumes to the maize system uh, to prevent the damages to the crop that livestock can cause. A second area of investment is development of community-based seed systems involving women in multiplication and distribution. Women are generally responsible for seed selection and have certain criteria for the seeds they choose. Expanding their involvement in multiplication and distribution of seed would help ensure that the seed system is responsive to the criteria that matter to pigeon pea farmers. It would also give women additional income earning opportunities. Building seed, uh, community seed systems would also entail training of those involved and integration of the formal and informal seed systems. One challenge here is that for anything that is sold at seed, current policy in Malawi requires the seed to be certified, not just quality declared. So this is an issue that would have to be addressed in in uh, trying to strengthen local seed systems. The third area of investment is to improve storage and transportation infrastructure to reduce food losses, improve seed quality, and reduce the need for farmers to, to sell at harvest. Better storage can also help to mitigate the lack of market power exercised by farmers, especially when women, minimize the need to travel, reduce food loss, and improve incomes. Hand in hand with storage improvements is the need for improved transportation infrastructure, which is a well-known priority, but one that's especially critical for food system performance. A fourth area of investment would be in small-scale processing capacity to provide alternatives to expensive products processed by exporters and reduce processor to consumer transport costs. Some of the pigeon pea that's processed for export uh, Dehold and split, as, as Stephanie said, is sold within Malawi, but at high prices in major markets. Since processed pigeon pea is valued because of its reduced cooking time, this is important. More spatially distributed small-scale processing could increase the availability of processed pigeon pea at lower prices. Fifth area of investment is access to information about market prices and volumes traded for legumes and to capital, financial services, and business management training for traders and processors. These improvements would be especially helpful for informal actors in the legume value chain and for women entrepreneurs. Lastly, investment would be 
uh, needed in networking and collective action to reduce costs and increase bargaining power for small-scale legume producers and agribusiness entrepreneurs, again, especially for women. Collective activity properly implemented can help women and other low-resource food system actors to leverage resources and gain profitable access to markets. Of course, there are major hurdles in developing and managing such organizations, such as building trust within the group, but such organizational forms are familiar to many people and their value is already understood. Now let's look at medium-term impacts. This slide shows a very preliminary and general list of potential medium-term impacts that we think expansion of MLM technology would bring. Our research did not include quantitative estimates of income gains or other benefits, but we can say, first of all, that MLM would provide higher and more stable climate resilient yields than maize cultivation alone, number one. Number two, for target group one, they would gain higher cash incomes as well as improved nutrition and more sustainable levels of soil fertility from the introduction of legumes to the maize system. Target group two would gain greater food security, meaning improved nutrition, more resilient cropping systems, and less reliance on food purchases. Other impacts of the scale up of MLM technology would include improved seed systems in, in the center and south of Malawi, as a result of the investments discussed in the previous slide, and greater availability of legumes in urban markets with more consistent prices and quantities. What's the relevance of this to other crop value chains? As, as Stephanie noted, um, Pigeon P is not one of the uh, FTF program priorities. Uh, soybeans and groundnuts are the priority in, in the Feed the Future strategy. Uh, some of the ways in which our research are, are relevant to these other crops are that uh, at least a couple of the reports do talk about other legumes, including soybeans and groundnuts. Um, the teams who focused on mapping the formal marketing system and looking at future prospects, future demand prospects, and the team that looked at institutional and policy constraints both covered a wide range of, of, of types of legumes. Also, the systems approach to scaling that we have described in this presentation, I think is, gener is generally applicable, applicable to all types of legumes uh, through its combination of social, institutional, and technology factors that are taken into account. Lastly, I think that the insights into high and low potential growing areas based on the mapping of satellite uh, information on land use and productivity and weather data and climate trends is uh, easily applicable to considering uh, where soybeans and groundnuts would be most suitable from a production standpoint uh, and taking into account other factors such as location to market. What are some next steps for GCFSI here? Um, the GCFSI draft work plan for this coming fiscal year, starting October 1st, is currently being reviewed by USAID. It includes three major areas of work that relate to Malawi. If approved, these activities would include some extension of the research conducted last year. For example, this would include further research and analysis regarding sustainable intensification of legume maize production systems and where and how to scale up these improved technologies. Secondly, it includes a focus on developing improved legume and maize seed systems with the focus on maize, systems, maize seed systems designed to support USAID's climate resilient maize scaling project. Thirdly, it would include support for uh, the innovation hub uh, which GCFSI set up uh, in concert with LUNAR, which is hosted by LUNAR, through faculty and student grants for, for innovative work, through innovation and communication skills training, and through curriculum changes that would improve workforce readiness of LUNAR graduates as a function of skill needs in, in different sectors of the food system. So this final slide simply lists links to uh, different aspects of the G GCFSI work plan and, and activities uh, that you can consult. We encourage you to look at these. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, 
Stephanie uh, give, give a quick explanation of the Malawi Frugal Innovation Practicum, which we think was a very interesting and successful activity conducted quite recently. I'll just be very brief on that. That was just a, um, it was a um, activity carried out in collaboration with Luanar, um, where, in which we brought students together from both institutions, um, from a range of disciplines, to um, do action research in urban food markets, and urban open air food markets. Um, and while it was mainly an education activity, the students were doing action research, so they really helped to increase our knowledge about what was going on in urban food markets and what the difficulties are there. Um, so we will carry forward with that. Um, I would just encourage you to check out those links for more from the students um, uh, on that activity. Um, and then, so the last, the last, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the funding that we received from the U.S. Global Development Lab and from the USAID Bureau for Food Security. We also leverage funding from the Africa Rising Project and from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and also, great, big thanks to Luanar um, senior administrators who helped to um, coordinate this huge beast of a research project that we carried out last summer, which um, had a lot of moving parts. Um, and of, of course, always, um, we were, it's just always so nice to be, to have um, people engage with us um, in answering all of our strange questions. So thank you to the farmers and private entrepreneurs in Malawi. And now we can take some questions. Uh, thanks, Eric and Stephanie. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in already. Um, we're just going to pause just for a few seconds so that uh, they can take a look at them, and we'll answer them one by one. But please feel free to um, answer more questions in the Q&A box. Okay. Um, thanks to all of you for your questions. We'll do what we can to try to answer them. Um, first question is whether we measured biomass production of the crop residue of the legume. Um, uh, I can't really answer that question, uh, but certainly this is an aspect of the benefit of, of legumes that uh, is, is well recognized. Um, uh, Regis Chikoo asks about uh, impediments related with marketing and also processing of pigeon pea. Uh, where exactly is the bottleneck? Um, I think one of the bottlenecks here is that um, since many producers of, of pigeon pea are women, they have difficulty um, with the resources required to get uh, the legumes to the market, um, and there are there's really a lack of, of local processing uh, technology uh, outside of the mark, main market towns or even the the export uh, zone in, in Blantyre. So there are both, uh, there are not so much production problems as marketing and post-harvest processing problems. Um, there's a question about agricultural yield trends for Malawi. Are we talking about, uh, we're talking about, that's a very good question. The, the map that, that showed that information is a map that looks at land use uh, uh, using satellite imagery, uh, which is uh, strongly correlated with agricultural productivity. But you're quite right, this is a measure of aggregate productivity. It's not a focus specifically on productivity of multipurpose legume crops. Um, next question. Uh, Yes, I think the question is suggesting that uh, a focus in training should should be given to cooking legumes uh, and to improvements in the protein content. I think this is um, understood to be one of the benefits of improving the availability of legumes uh, among rural households. Um, okay, Cynthia asks, let me read the question here. Uh, 
Um, okay, this is a good suggestion. Um, we uh, have proposed in our work plan a new area of activity uh, that focuses on seed system development. So uh, these contacts that you're mentioning here are things that we will need to follow up on. Uh, so um, we will certainly do that. Um, appreciate those suggestions. Uh, well, the question about whether the research addresses issues of dietary diversity or nutrient availability in the diets, I don't believe that there was any uh, survey work done to look at the um, composition of consumption of the rural households, but, but again, I think the idea, one, one of the um, known benefits of, of increasing the availability of legumes at the household level is that it will contribute to these objectives of dietary diversity and nutrient availability that you call attention to. Um, <clears throat> the last question here, how important are the multipurpose legumes in the current diet and income of farm households? Um, it, well, it would vary, yes. Um, the, the team that, that looked at um, consumption patterns uh, would have some information on the um, importance of pigeon pea in the household expenditure or consumption pattern. I couldn't give you those numbers offhand. They may be included in that particular report. Um, but uh, certainly, we believe that pigeon pea does play an important role. Pigeon pea and other legumes play an important role in household diets and, and in income, especially for, for women within the households. Um, okay, William Baird asked a question about financing. Um, we do uh, feel based on the research that this is an impediment, especially for female growers. Uh, we don't to have a specific plan for how to address that. Um, the, the work that we did was, was designed to um, identify in general what sorts of investments would be needed to scale this up. We don't have uh, a mandate really to uh, actually implement a scale up program and, and so some of the specifics of, of how exactly you would implement these investments haven't yet been addressed, and that would include details of a financing or a credit microcredit plan. Uh, which legume is best for Malawian soil? Well, I don't think either Stephanie or I are qualified to answer that question, uh, but I think that, that that would depend in part on, on where in Malawi you're talking about. Uh, I've, I've been impressed by the work done by our biophysical sciences team in, in identifying the diversity of zones within Malawi and, and determining, uh, based on that information, where a particular legume like uh, pigeon pea would be most suited. So uh, I, I think one could use that approach to evaluate the areas within Malawi that are suitable for the different legumes, and then that could answer your question about what percent of, for each legume, what percent of the area of Malawi is, is, is well suited for the production of that crop. Uh, not seeing any uh, other questions coming in. Uh, to answer a question that came in earlier via chat, yes, this webinar is being recorded. And we'll send a link to all the people who registered um, in the next couple days. Uh, oh, we do have one additional question oh, yeah. that came in. Um, so I'll let Eric and Stephanie uh, address that. Okay, this is a question from Leo Zulu, who's one of our colleagues, uh, worked in, uh, as a colleague in two of our research projects, um, uh, mentioning livestock damage Yes. Uh, so, uh, you're, Leo, you're referring to some work that has been done to try to move forward in determining ways in, in which at the community level, um, livestock and, and legume and maize production could coexist in some harmonious way. Um, 
and and you're suggesting that um, um, the benefits of doing this would be sufficient to motivate communities to to develop these these uh, working relationships. So thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to thank Eric and Stephanie for their expertise and. Uh, being able to take uh, an incredible breadth of, of research and condensing it down into 40 minutes. Um, have a great day, everybody, and watch, watch your email and social media website for a link to this recorded webinar. Thank you very much.